Hey, welcome everybody. Happy Friday. My name is Mark Maderos and I am the Senior Manager of Community Engagement at Peninsula Open Space Trust. We hope all of you are starting your new year as well as possible. Before anything else, I'd like to acknowledge the Native people whose territories we are joining from, considering post-working area. I'd like to acknowledge the Mawekma Ohlone Tribe and the Amamutsun Tribal Band as well as the Rametush Ohlone. Wherever you are, please pause to acknowledge the Native people whose land you are on. And remember that the next step beyond acknowledging these communities is to learn more, particularly about how you could support them directly. And of course, welcome to all members of Native communities who are joining us today. Um, before we start, I want to welcome new uh, community members who are not familiar with Peninsula Open Space Trust and share a little bit more about our work. Since 1977, POST has protected over 80,000 acres of land in San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Northern Santa Cruz, found, uh, Santa Cruz counties. And of course, this is thanks to the thousands of people who are part of POST's donor community. And I wanna say a big thank you to all of you, especially after this end of year fundraising season where so many of you blessed us um, so generously with your um, contributions. This work is absolutely thanks to your support and thousands of people like you. And this map shows all of the land we've protected since our founding, most of which is now part of our regional parks network. Pretty cool. We're doing a great job in our area. So next, I'd like to acknowledge two of our partners in regards to Bear Island, which is the focus of today's talk, the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. <clears throat> First, about San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory, also known as SFBBO. This year marks their 40th anniversary. SFBBO is a local nonprofit based in the South Bay area that has been restoring native plant communities at Bear Island since 2015. And as a tidal marsh ecosystem, Bear Island contains dozens of acres of adjacent habitat known as upland transition zones, which have been severely impacted due to development in the Bay area. SFBBO works to reintroduce locally native plants to these zones which provide habitat for sensitive marsh species such as Ridgeway's rail and the salt marsh harvest mouse. Through their work, SFBBO also researches how birds use their restored habitats by conducting seasonal surveys. You could visit their website at sfbbo.org. And next, the US Fish and Wildlife Service's mission is to work with others to conserve, protect and enhance fish and wildlife and plants and their habitats for the continuing benefit of the American people. And I'm gonna share a little bit more about the Donna Edwards National Wildlife Refuge now, along with some details about post's involvement at Bear Island. So Bear Island is located just east of downtown Redwood City, just south of Foster City on the SF Bay and was one of the last remaining restorable wetlands in the Bay Area when it was severely threatened by development in the 90s. In 1997, Post protected 1,623 acres of Bear Island for a sum of $15 million. This was one of our most ambitious projects at the time, and since then we've just gone on to complete even more ambitious conservation proje projects across the region. And the support that we got from our donor community um, on this project really jump-started a whole series of projects through the coming decades. So we did this with the support of the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, as well as $5.5 million from private individuals in our donor community. So again, thank you. Many of you might have contributed to that campaign. So soon after Post transferred the property to the US Fish and Wildlife Service to become part of the Don Edwards San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge, the, nation, the nation's first urban national wildlife refuge that stretches across 30,000 acres and provides a safe haven for millions of migratory birds and endangered species. 
You could learn more about the San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge Complex at a link that we'll be sharing in chat. So today we get to learn all about the birds of Bear Island and we're welcoming back local bird language instructor, instructor and naturalist, Jeff Kaplan. Jeff weaves 30 years as a naturalist and teacher of communication skills to cultivate a common language for connecting more deeply with nature and birds. He weaves mindfulness, citizen science, and bird language to help people from diverse backgrounds feel curious and connected in nature. If you want an invitation to Jeff's smaller, more personalized workshops on backyard bird language and other topics, please go to commonlanguagenature.com. Uh, we've enjoyed many webinars with Jeff, and I'm really happy to be starting the new year. First thing with another webinar with Jeff. And with that, I'd like to welcome Jeff to this stream. Hey, Jeff. Hey, hi, Mark. Great to see you again. Hi, everybody. So glad we're here in the new year 2021 and getting to connect with more of the birds and more of the land that you help protect with POST. So thank you so much. Great. Happy New Year. And, um, you know, I was thinking about Bear Island mm. and as a novice birder, I think about the birds I see out at the Baylands, and so many of them are so distinct from one another. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's an easier job sometimes um, to, you know, pick them out as individual species and and learn their names. And I've act I've still had trouble, so I'm I'm really excited to hear from you today. I know many others are too. Great. Well, we're definitely going to help you identify different birds that are out there, but also sharpen your skills for connecting with nature, developing your curiosity, noticing what they're doing and how they're making a living out there uh, on the Bayland. So it's going to be really exciting. Great. Cool, Jeff. So you can take over. And just as a reminder to everybody, we will have time for a few questions at the end. So thank you, Jeff. Here we go. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for the Birds of Bear Island and the San Francisco Bay Area. And I know there's a lot of people watching today. So wherever you are in the world, I hope you get a chance to visit this amazing gem of nature in the middle of the urban jungle. And I also want to acknowledge this is the seventh online event we've done with POST. So if you enjoy this or if you want to go back and learn some more birds, feel free to look up on the YouTube channel. Uh, Birds of Bear Creek Redwoods, and this is Post's YouTube channel. Birds of Calero Oaks and the woodlands there. Windy Hill Wildlands, which is just above Palo Alto. And then the Bay Area Raptor Rundown. And I also want to take a moment and thank not only the, the donors, but also the volunteers. People who went out there when it was time to uh, make Bear Island a place, give it back to nature and give it back to the birds. And just folks who joined and helped out with our different agencies clean up the trash and get it ready because right now it's a wonderful place to go. I also want to acknowledge SFBBO because they lead field trips for school groups. And we're going to make this presentation a little bit fun and a little bit playful. It might even be called goofy, but you know, we got a lot of kids watching and it's important to invite them to become birders and to invite them to help protect the future generations. Because if we can protect all the birds, we can protect all of nature. And so just to uh, summarize, my name is Jeff Kaplan, and I'm the director of the Common Language Nature Program. And my goal is to help people become more connecting, more respecting, and more protecting of nature. And so we'll be doing a lot of that, not just identifying birds, but also doing what we can to uh, connect and learn from nature. And I also want to say, excuse me, are you going to introduce me or what? Oh, hi. <laughs> this is our uh, co-host, Perry, the Peregrine Falcon. Uh, hi. I love shorebirds, um, especially ducks with sauce on them. Yeah. Okay. Well, great, Perry. We'll be talking to you more later on because I know you did some research on where do the ducks uh, and different bird names come from. Yeah, that's right. I did. I, I love them. Okay, great. Well, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye, everybody. All right. So. Now, the other thing I want to say is just express my gratitude to everyone who's watching this right now. Because let's face it, the birds need our support. And by watching this, you are developing your skills for connecting, protecting, and respecting the birds. This is an owl that was rescued by a friend of mine in um, Ecuador, way south. And uh, But just by watching here, you're developing your skills to connect and hopefully protect and support the birds. So thank you so much for being here today. So what are we going to talk about? 
Well, today we're going to spend a little bit of time sharpening your memory skills and your observation skills for birds and nature. Because, you know, to be honest, Post protected all this land to do more than just make a documentary or a bird guide. They want you to have experiences and have connection and during these times of shelter in place, be able to go outside and really rejuvenate. So that's what I'm gonna be doing today is giving you some memory skills and some observation tips. The second thing we're gonna do is discover migrating ducks and shorebirds of the Bay Area and Bear Island. And yes, indeed, we can name them and they'll be part of it. Now, if you enjoy using some of these techniques, I'm gonna teach more of them in the future in smaller classes. I teach backyard bird language. And uh, that's one of the things that I'll be telling you a little bit more about later on. The next one that's coming up in particular is called bird love because you know birds need to find a mate in the spring and through learning bird language, you can learn to understand what they're saying while they're looking for one. And we'll also take time to answer your questions. Now, we're not gonna be able to go over all the birds that are there at Bear Island but if you want a big list of the 67 birds, then head on over to commonlanguagenature.com and you can download that list. All right, here we go. So let's see, what should we start with? What will be the first birds of Bear Islands? You know, I guess the first thing will be the ducks. Why? Well, because in my opinion, the ducks are the classic stars of the bird world. Yes, I know we love hummingbirds and raptors, but Ducks, you know, if you were going to make a movie about birds, you might make it about ducks because they're kind of like the underdogs. They're they're eaten by all kinds of animals, uh, including humans that hunt them. Uh, they have to work hard to raise all their babies and keep them in a line behind them as they're swimming through the water. And they have to move twice a year, right? So many of them migrate up to the north and then come migrating back south. And it's just amazing. I mean, they're so mighty. Somebody should make a movie. Oh, the Mighty Ducks. That's right. Disney made that movie. In fact, they made three of them. And then they founded a hockey team. Okay, well, the once Disney sold off the hockey team, they changed it just to the Ducks of Anaheim. But with all due respect to both Disney and the Ducks of Anaheim, uh, you know, their, uh, their copyright, we're not going to talk about Mighty Ducks today. Uh, instead, we will be talking about the Flighty Ducks of Bear Island. Are you ready? Here we go. Now, the first thing you need to do is get to Bear Island to go on this trail. So, of course, you ask your phone for directions and you say uh, directions to Bear Island. And that will very easily lead you to point A on the map, which is the wrong place to go. <clears throat> so if you're like me, you prefer not to drive another 10 minutes back where the way you came to get to the correct point, which is point B. So everybody repeat after me, Bear Island Trail Parking Lot. One more time. But okay, you get the idea. That's what you want to ask your phone for directions to, Bear Island Trail Parking Lot. So you drive in there, you park, and you walk towards the back of the parking lot, and you'll see this sign which says, no trespassing, you can't go this way, authorized. Where are we going? Didn't I see that this is the right place when I first drove in? So what you need to do is turn around, and in the voice of Yoda, the directions are, the trail ahead is behind us. And that's the truth. So what we got to do is come out the way that we came in, take a right, walk down the street, cross the street, and then you will get to a bridge and kind of a gateway, kind of a portal into Bear Island. Now, I have to say that we're going to take a hike around three quarters of the island, 1.7 miles each way. First, we'll turn to the right and go out to the observation deck where we'll get to look at Smith Slough and see what's there. And then we'll turn back and walk all the way around and see whole bunches of different birds in different habitats. Are you ready? Okay. And one thing I have to say about Bear Island is that it is really a breath of fresh air, even if you're wearing your mask, it's a breath of fresh air amid the urban jungle. Everywhere you look around Bear Island is covered with buildings and uh, Highway 101 and factories and apartments. And so this is not only a breath of fresh air because it's it's a piece of land and nature that's so closely nestled in, but it's also the biggest island in the San Francisco Bay that is a preserve. So I think we're really gonna see something special. All right, here we go. Take our walk, turn to the right, and then cross the street. And this is the bridge that you'll cross over because Bear Island has water all the way around it. And as you get to the fence, you'll see a sign. And the sign says, hey, probably not the best place to bring your pets. Ah, darn, you know, love to go out for a walk with a dog, but I guess mm, this isn't the best place, probably because 
it's just so close to you're so close to the birds. I, I did see a family that had three dogs walking out here uh, off leash, and one of them ran over to the side and grabbed something in its mouth and started choking on it. And the poor family had to tear it out of its mouth. They said it was the stinkiest thing that it had ever bit down on. So yeah, I guess this is a good place to let our pets not come and take them someplace else. All right, here we go. Now, whenever I get to a place like Bear Island or any other of the post preserves, I need to take a minute just to slow down because if I don't, I'll be thinking about my taxes and you know who are the people I have to call and what are all the things I need to do. So if you don't mind, just join me in a mindful moment here and take a, a deep breath. And uh, this is gonna be kind of boring at first, but hopefully it can help me get centered. And uh, yeah, here we go. Okay, I'm a little bit more focused now. I'm a little bit more open to feeling really good and rejuvenated out here in nature. All right, so one thing I wanna say is that we are gonna focus a little bit on some skills for remembering the names of the birds and also for noticing and connecting more with them than we would if we just checked them off our bird list. I used to just check them off, but now I wanna do something more. And there are several different mentors in the Bay Area that uh, have really taught me a lot about this. One of them is David Lucas. David wrote the book, Birds of the San Francisco Bay Area. But more recently, he's come out with this great book that really helps me connect with nature more. It's called Language Making Nature. And he's done just so much research and shares so many ideas about how we can use language, make up words, put words together, help ourselves mm, internalize and share what we see in nature. And one of those techniques is called mnemonic. Mnemonic is coming up with a word that helps remind you of what you're seeing or what you're experiencing. So we'll be doing some of that. So for example, oh, and I have to say, David's work is great. And he is sharing so much on YouTube. Uh, if you go to his uh, website, uh, languagemakingnature.com. You'll see just tons of amazing things. Right now, he's up in the northern part of the United States and sharing so many photographs and things about what it's like for animals to be surviving in the snow. So I just uh, encourage you to check it out and check out his book. It really inspires me. But one of the mnemonic terms that I made up was a new moniker. In other words, I added some letters to the word mnemonic to make up a term for the new names that I'm gonna be using today to help me remember a lot of these birds. Of course, a moniker is a name and a new moniker is a new name. Now, another scientist that I've been following who's been using these skills for the past four years uh, to help him remember what he's seeing is Akoa. And he's the maker of the most new monikers. Yes, he's been doing it for four years because he's four years old. So. Akoa and I go out for walks and he's always coming up with different names for things he sees. And this really helps. So for example, looking at this bird, I say, well, the name of it is, you know, the, the traditional name of it, the official name of it is the snowy egret. And he's like, yeah, well, snow, they're both snow. They're both snowy color, you know, the, the great egret and the, the snowy egret. How am I gonna remember that? Okay, so looking at this, he sees those yellow toes. And he says, hmm, my new moniker, I'm gonna call it golden toes. I'm like, okay, great. And actually I've watched this bird with sink its golden toes into the mud and kind of flip them about, which looks like a fish lure and it actually lures the fish up to it. And then guess what? It's got dinner right there. So golden toes is very helpful. So I'll be sharing some different new monikers from different people, including Akoa. 
And I have to say that in Spanish, a lot of times the bird's names reflect what people see. So the name of this bird in Spanish is Garza Igret con dedos dorados, which is golden toes. All right, are you ready to see the first of the flighty ducks of Bear Island? Here we go. And as we go out, I'm reminded of my learning with John Muir Laws. Many of you may know John Muir Laws. He is an amazing, well-known around the Bay Area and around the world educator. He teaches nature journaling as a way for you to develop your skills of observation, curiosity, and wonder. So head on over to johnmuirlaws.com. We'll, we'll put that in the, in the chat. And one of the things that he says is, you know, when you're trying to look at something and observe it, if you just stare at it, you're not going to get that far. And he says, you know, Jeff, if I just name this bird for you, <clears throat> then you're going to check it off your list and ignore it. So instead of just naming it, he asks the question, well, what do you notice? So I say, what's the name of that bird, John? He says, well, what do you notice? So now at first, when I try to notice, I don't get anywhere. You know, I just look at it. I look hard. I look really hard. Everybody try that. Look hard at this bird. Okay, look really hard. Yeah, what do you notice? And John Muir Laws points out, my brain gets tired. It just sees the same thing and doesn't move ahead. So the technique he's taught me that I'm going to share with you is verbalization, or otherwise known as talking to yourself. And what that does is it increases our memory, it increases our observation, and it increases our personal connection. So we are going to be doing some verbalization, talking to yourself, with each of the new birds that I'm going to be introducing to you. Now, if you want to, you can get your binoculars out right now. Oh, what? You didn't bring them? Oh, okay, fine. Uh, well, then you can do what Audubon has done, which is they have taught kids how to build practice binoculars with toilet paper rolls. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it helps them focus. You didn't bring your toilet paper rolls? Okay, fine. All right, in that case, take out your expensive hand binoculars. Now, you might think, this is silly, Jeff. This is just a kid thing. No, I also work at a museum of art. And in the museum of art, when there's a huge landscape, we invite people to take out your expensive hand binoculars so you can focus on one part. So that's what we're going to do here. With or without hand binoculars, we're going to focus, and then we're going to verbalize on what we see. Basically, in summary, you're going to see something. You're going to say it out loud so that it goes out of your mouth into your ear, back into your brain, and you have really moved yourself on to the next thing you see and the next thing you see and the next thing you see. Because frankly, I wanna do more than just walk back from Bear Island with a list of birds. I wanna walk back from Bear Island feeling good and with a connection to birds and nature. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Everybody, get out your hand binoculars or just take a look. What do you notice about this bird? Here it goes. And talk it out loud, go. All right, so I see a green on the head. Come, come on, people. Everybody talk at the same time, wherever you are. Talk, go. Uh, okay, it's green on the head, and then the bill is yellow. And then um, there's, a, there's a black dot. I never noticed that before. Black dot on the bill, and uh, it's got a black dot on the side of the nose, and then the eye. Keep talking. We're going to do this for about 20 seconds. And then and the eye and the nose dot and the beak are all in the line. That's interesting. Huh, okay. That, the chest is kind of brown. And you're not listening to me. You're listening to you. And um, this is the neck. I've got this white band. Okay. Good. And, mm, oh, brown collar. I never noticed that. Around the back of the neck. And then there's going to keep going. Uh, there's this kind of brown wavy line that kind of goes. Okay. And gray on the bottom. And the, the tail has got black and white. Feathers and what is that? Oh, there's like a hook feather on the very back. Huh. Okay. okay, finish up. All right. Now, hopefully, you noticed more about the mallard duck than you ever have before. But one thing I have to say is when we talk about the mallard duck, this is the only one we talk about. Hello, that is so bird gender biased. Come on, people. We got to also celebrate the female ducks. So, ready? What do you notice? Go. Okay, so um, she's got an orange bill instead of a yellow bill. Black, and it's got that blue stripe, black stripe, white stripe, a little bit of white on the tail, brown, oh, brown and feathers. Yeah, she's um, same bill one. Okay, everybody got that? All right, good. All right, so again, 
couple of interesting facts about the mallards beyond what you just noticed is that mallards are the most successful duck in North America. What do I mean? Well, we see them everywhere. That's because they are so adapted to all of the different challenges, environmental challenges and ways of getting food that ducks need to adapt to. Now, I have to say that when you hear that quack, quack, that is not a male duck. That is the female duck. So the female duck is the one who is making the noise. The male duck has kind of a raspy voice. It's more like, hey, has anybody seen the remote control? <sighs> okay, so get the idea. And the last thing is like all ducks, mallard ducks are waterproof. How do they do this? Well, they have an oil called the pineal gland that excretes oil, and then they have to take that oil and squish it around through all of their feathers in order to float. And that's why we call it water off a duck's back. All right. The last thing I'll say about the mallard is they have a very special eating etiquette. Uh, for my friends who are watching from South America, I'm talking about the etiquette for being polite and eating in the right way, same way that uh, different people in different cultures eat politely in different ways. Well, eating etiquette for a mallard is what my friends in the banana slug string band call butts up. That's the mallards eating right now. Okay, that's all we're going to say about mallards right now. Let's head on to the next of the flighty ducks of Bear Island. What do you notice? Take a little bit of time and notice this one. Okay, also got a green head. See, that bill is black and giant and uh, it's like twice as big. And then the white chest, brown sides, brown back, black and white in the tail too. And oh, and the yellow eye, that's pretty cool. Okay, everybody got that? Now, interesting enough about this bird, in addition to having a green head but looking very different from the mallard, at least the male, let's take a look at them eating because their eating etiquette is also very different. Yeah, definitely not putting their heads down underwater. Okay, so what were they doing? What did you notice? Ah, pretty cool. Now, here's a poem that I wrote to help me remember the name of this bird. Here goes. While other ducks eat by going butts up, I swim, I eat swimming full steam ahead. While they're munching on mud, which sounds like a dud, I'm slurping up bugs and plankton instead. I carry a big white trash bag on my chest and I fill it with food. Then I take a short rest. I never beg. No, I'm never a groveler. With my big black bill, I'm the Northern Shoveler. And that's the name, the common name of this bird, the Northern Shoveler. In Spanish, pato cucharron, which means big spoon. Well, actually it means ladle, which is on its way to a shovel. So you get the idea. Now, interesting facts about the Northern Shoveler. It was the third place winner in the pop contest in 2013. What do I mean? Popularity? No, population. Huge quantities of Northern Shovelers. Now they're in fifth place. So if you want to know who are the more populated ducks, you can go online and check that out. The second thing is that they have a 110 water filter. 110 volts? No. 110 little holes. Um, my friends in Ecuador who drink mate tell me that they enjoy using this straw that has a filter at the end, and that straw is called a bombilla. Well, bombilla. Well, actually, it's very similar to the beak of the northern shoveler because it's got all these little laminae that come down and allow it to filter out the water and eat all the yummy stuff that it's collected. The last thing that's interesting about the northern shoveler is that they do a pinwheel dance for dinner. What do I mean? Well, if you go out and look at Northern Shovelers eating as a group, you might see this. Oh yeah, that is spinning around. They put their beaks in the middle and then they kind of form a pinwheel. Really interesting. So, 
Now, interesting thing about shovelers is they remind me that many of us have learned to migrate in our lives. You know, the northern shovelers migrate from where I am in California all the way up into Alaska and way up into northern Canada. They go north to south. My family went west to east. We were I was born in LA and then went to New York and then each year we come back and just all kinds of migration. So, for everybody who's migrated during the year or whose family has immigrated from another country to here, I think the ducks really represent one of the skills that we've learned how to adapt to. All right. So that's all we've got on the Northern Shoveler. Are you ready for the next of the flighty ducks? And you know what I'm going to say? I'm going to say, what do you notice? Okay, take a minute. What do you notice? It's got green on its head also, but it's got, got a white spot. And its beak is really short. And it's got a white thing right there on the, on the, on the wing. It's got like lips and black and white on the tail. The feathers are... Okay, pretty cool. Everybody got that? Now, another green-headed duck. Uh-huh. How are we going to separate this duck with green on its head from the other ducks that have green on their head? Well, this one has an extra feature on the front. Did you notice that? That, that kind of white part? What do you call an extra feature on your cell phone? You know, did you know that you can put extra features on the front of your cell phone? I, I know I did this. I put a big one up for the weather and the air quality when it was time to be checking out. An extra feature like that is called a widget. Okay, some of you know where I'm going with this because this duck has an extra feature on the front too. And that extra feature I'm gonna call the widget. And that's why I'm calling this the widget duck. Actually, the common name is the American widget. So again, these are just new monikers that I come up with to help me remember. Now, please remember, new monikers are created to help individuals remember what they observe and enjoy. These are not the official names of the American Birding Association or anyone who is an American uh, who is named Bird Life Lister. My attorney Akoa invites you to make up your own bird new monikers so that you can remember what you want to remember. Okay, that was the uh, disclaimer. And yeah, definitely do what Akoa is doing and make up your own new monikers. All right, let's take a minute and take a look and see what we notice. What are some differences between the male and the female and just about the female in general? Go ahead. Yeah, she doesn't have the green on her head, but she's got the same kind of point and the black eye and that short beak. Some of the feathers are black. Tail is not black and white and it's got that white ellipse shape. Okay, got it? Great. Now. If you ever wonder about the American widgeon, here are some interesting facts about it. The first thing is that it is more vegetarian than most other ducks. It's got a shorter bill and that enables it to pull grass out of the ground. So you'll see it on golf courses, you'll see it on your lawn, you'll see it all kinds of places, or if it's in the water, then it's mostly tearing up and pulling out vegetables, plants. It is one of the most far northern nesters. It will fly way up north past many of the other ducks to nest and deal with the cold. And then the last place, the last thing is that it's often nicknamed the bald pate widgeon. And for those of you who don't know that term, bald pate, what does that mean? Um, bald pate means, well, it means something like this, you know, where the hair is disappearing and you see white flashing off it. Yeah. So if you see uh, a bird that looks kind of like me with the bald pate, then... Um, you know that that's the bald pate widgeon with the widget on its front. All right. Now, as you look across Bear Island, you may notice that Bear Island may seem like a very bare island. Like there's nothing there practically, except for PG&E towers and, uh, you know, some dead grass and stuff like that. But the truth is, it's worth taking time to look a little bit closer because Bear Island is anything but a bear island. And I invite you to research and to read the work of Dr. Nicole Heller. She was the conservation director at Post, and she's done great work. And she just shows the huge web of life that Bear Island supports. She says Bear Island is a refuge for hundreds of species of wildlife, including a few that are endangered. So we'll put the link to that in the chat. And I think that you will enjoy reading about the work that she's done. Okay, moving along, if you get to go to Bear Island now, you'll really enjoy the contrast with seeing Bear Island later on in the spring. All right, 
So moving to the next site, we can see, I mean, I just love all those flowers in the spring. Can you imagine? It's, it's huge. Okay, so we just took the first part of our walk. We went out onto the first observation deck to look at Smith Slough in a certain spot. And now we're gonna turn back and walk around the corner. And I have to say that you will see a lot of PG and E towers crossing Bear Island. And I have to give thanks uh, to the power of PG and E, both for helping us run all of our electric things, but also because when they put the towers in, they also put this one bridge in. And this bridge crosses, I think it's a maintenance bridge, it crosses one of the canals so that people can see it. And uh, so it's got a sign on it, uh, but pg e didn't put the sign right at the beginning of the bridge, they put it at the middle. And of course you can guess, the sign says no trespassing. So what I did was walk up to the sign because they put it in the middle of the bridge, read it. And then of course, give thanks to pg e because then I can turn. And for the only time at Bear Island, I am over the water and I can see ducks diving underwater. I can see ducks and their families together. I can see all kinds of shorebirds here from this little bridge. So I encourage you to respectfully walk out, see the bridge, see the canal, and then walk back. And thanks to pg &E for putting that out there. Now, what are some of the other flighty birds, the flighty ducks that we'll see there? Well, here's a very interesting one. Take a minute, what do you notice? Go. Okay, so I see black on the head, but I also see a big white kind of heart shape in the back. White on the chest, black feathers on the back, and uh, his beak is kind of short. Got a crab, I know, but really interesting. All right, and obviously you're going to get to observe this one more out at Bear Island. Let's take a look at the female. What do you notice about her? Oh, wow. Okay, so she's more grayish black. She's got a big kind of weird eye makeup right here on her cheek. Uh, and then her chest is gray. Same beak, a little white spot on one feather. Okay, pretty cool, huh? So, and this particular duck has got an interesting name and the interesting name is the Bufflehead. Now I've asked Perry to do a little bit of research and tell me exactly where this name came from. Uh, uh, well, I, I did research, but uh, I have to, uh, my, I'm not sure you're gonna like my answer. Okay, so what does the name of this bird mean? I don't know. Well, Reese, Perry, I asked you to do the research. You said you did the research and you found out. Yes, I did. So what's the name of the bird mean? I don't know. Well, excuse me, I, I'm getting a little confused here. You did the research or you didn't? I did the research. So what does it mean? I don't know. Wait a minute, is this like who's on first? Yes, exactly. Okay, so I don't know, third base. What we're talking about here is the name Bufflehead means similar to baffle because the name, the word buffle means to be confusing or to be at a loss. And so we're going to call this bird the baffle head. And by the way, they taste wonderful. Okay, great. Thank you, Perry. So if we're going to call this the buffle head or the baffle head is my new moniker to remember it, uh, then um, I'm, I'm curious what it's called in Spanish. In Spanish, this is called pato monja. Now, why is it called pato monja? Uh, here's the hint. Monja means none. Do you see the resemblance? Okay. So if this is pato monja, then what does that make this? Yes, the flying nun in Spanish. All right. Now, I think that's really interesting. Whoa, check it out. It's not all black and white. Yes, this is not all just black and white. In fact, many times when I fly by this duck, I see it turning shades of green and purple. That's very cool. The other thing is, if in Spanish, this is the nun duck, and this is a male, then this is definitely a case of cross-dressing. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Terry. So we're going to move on. And uh, the point is that buffleheads have that baffling name, but they also rent from flickers. Rent from flickers? Yes, when they raise their children, they need a nest. And unlike many of the other ducks, which will build nests on the ground, they need a hole in a tree. And most commonly, they are using a hole that was created by a northern flicker. So anytime I hear that, Kill! I say, thank you, flicker. But I imagine that there might be a bafflehead, I mean, bufflehead 
that's listening to and wondering where are the holes it created and can I move in there? The last thing I'll say about the Bufflehead is that it is very much into LTRs, long-term relationships. Many ducks will find a new partner each season, but the Bufflehead stays with its same partner year after year after year. Pretty interesting. Can you see that kind of looking like a nun's hat? Yeah, I do too. All right, well, let's move on to the next of the flighty ducks. Ready? What do you notice? Ooh, whoa. <laughs> That's different. Okay, so I got a big blue bill. And it's got black on the top of the head and black on the other blue wings. It's just kind of all reddish brown. And it's feathers stick up in the back. That's the first one I've seen. And white on the back, too. All right. So here we go. And now notice what do you notice about the female? Okay. Feathers in the back stick up also. Brown. It's got that. Kind of stripe on the face, kind of cheek or brown. Hmm. Okay, ready? Now, this is the ruddy duck, but I am going to be calling it the rowdy duck. Why am I doing that? Because it fights the most. It is the most pugnacious of all the ducks. It will chase all the other ducks away. It will even it even bugs bunnies. No, not Bugs Bunny. I mean, it bugs bunnies. It will chase rabbits away from the edge of the water. Yes, it, it just fights with everybody. Now, it also has the biggest babies. What do I mean by that? I mean, it's got a giant egg, largest egg in comparison with its body size of any of the ducks. And what happens as a result is that baby duck stays inside that egg and grows and grows and grows and grows longer than other ducks. And when it comes out, when it cracks out of the egg, it's able to leave in just a few days. It doesn't need to be protected. So um, pretty amazing. It's the ruddy, rowdy duck. Whew, there's a bunch of ducks. Now, at this point, we've reached a sign that really talks about the evolutionary cycle of the land here at Bear Island. I mean, you know, when you think about it, initially, this was just land for birds and bees and whatever lived in nature. Then the native peoples came and they hunted and fished and did what they did to also be part of Bear Island. Then Bear Island was bought by the Bear family and turned into a cattle business. Yeah. Then that was bought by the salt making industry and turned into salt ponds. So this was pretty much destroyed. You know, just it was just dead salt. Now, finally, with the work of Post and other agencies, this has been given back to nature and to humans. And it's just a great place for all of us. So I just want to acknowledge all of the cycles that. Um, Bear Island has gone through, and it's, I'm so happy that it's come back in the cycle uh, to be a place for nature. Now, whew, I'm getting hungry at this point. We've been talking so long. So we are going to join the ducky dinner bunch. We ready? This is time to puzzle about the different ducks and what they do for dinner. And why do I bring this up? Well, you know, there is so much dining diversity among different ducks, especially rubber ducks. So... First level of eating etiquette is called dabbling duck. Of course, who does this? Dabbling means to put your butts up or bottoms up, put your butts up and put your mouth down in the mud and squish the mud together and try and find things to eat. That's dabbling. And who does this? The mallard. Okay, moving right along. The next one eating etiquette is filter feeding. And as you remember, this is done by the Shoveler, the northern shoveler, great. The next kind of eating etiquette is what the bufflehead, bufflehead, bufflehead does, and that's diving. I mean, how else are you going to be getting this crab off the bottom? Yeah, you got to be diving. And uh, the next one, and this is interesting, all these different eating etiquettes, all these different ways that different ducks eat, is the widget, I mean, widgeon, and with its short beak that's very sturdy, it is able to do grazing. And so these ducks uh, will be grazing on the golf course, on your front lawn, all kinds of different places. And of course, in marshes, American widgeon. So the question is, what do you think the eating etiquette is for this bird, for this rowdy, ruddy duck? And the answer is, there is no etiquette, of course. It does filtering and diving, and it just, you know, it does a whole bunch of different things. So speaking of diving, we are going to practice the rules 
for diving dinner right now. Are you ready? Okay. In a minute, we're all going to take a deep breath and then breathe out. Then we are going to compress our feathers, uh, squeeze yourself together. Then we are going to stay down for 20 seconds, hold your breath for 20 seconds. And the whole time we're gonna be looking for food. Are you ready? Okay, everybody take a deep breath. Breathe it out, all the way out, even more. Okay, here we go. Squeeze your body together. Okay, go. Look for food. That's five. We're going to 20. Look for food. That's 10. That, that's 15. Keep all that. <sighs> okay, you can come up for air. So next time you see a duck diving, try that. Breathe out and hold your breath and see if you can stay down as long as it can stay down because that is a lot of work for a duck to do just to get some dinner. Okay, we've made our way all the way around Bear Island and uh, well, three fourths of it, we went 1.7 miles. And we're on our view of Smith Slough. And you know, we look out across Smith Slough and actually I'm looking at something else that's not a duck, huh? So this next duck is not a duck. What is it? All right, take a minute. What do you notice? Mm, yeah, there's some black and white wings and oh, sorry, beak, it's like curved up. <laughs> And um, blue legs, white on the tail, black eye. All right. Now, how am I going to remember the name of this bird? Ugh. So I thought about it. I thought about its beak. And then I remembered having a conversation with my friend Petcheri, who is a sculptor. She's a famous sculptor because she sculpts giant pumpkins, giant watermelons in the way that she learned. It's a Thai traditional sculpture. So. And that knife that she's using is the first thing that helps me remember this bird because it looks like this, which looks like the bird's beak. So she uses it for big vegetables and fruits. I use it for little ones like an avocado. I'm going to cut the avocado open and check and see. Yeah, it feels right. But uh, is it all black and you know bruised inside or am I ready to eat it? So here's the poem I wrote about me and Petri to remind me of the name of this bird. Laughing with my friend, a sculptor named Pet, she makes art with a very curvy, curvy knife, super sharp, you bet. While she carves fruit, I carve veggies with it, especially the tastiest alligator pears, that's avocados, I can get. Our common tool is called a bird beak knife, that's the name. Its shape is the key to this shore bird's life. If you see black, avocado skin feathers that come as a set with an upturned beak. That's our friend, the, some of you know, avo set. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Avocet. Yeah. But now that I'm talking about avocados, it's an avo set to me. That's my new moniker. All right. Got it? That knife, that, those black stripes on the wings. So take a minute now, and you've been looking at the winter plumage, Let's take a look at the summer breeding plumage. So this is the male. Take a look, what do you notice? Okay, so those black feathers on the wings, now they're curvier and bigger. And the head is all brown, kind of like the eyes, still black. Okay, all right, so that's what you notice about the male avocet. Now we're gonna take a look at the female avocet. Also in the breeding plumage, what do you notice are the difference? Hey. They're really similar. Hmm. Uh, see if you can find one major difference. Okay. Moving along. Information about the American avocet. Well, first of all, the female has the more bendy beak. Yes, the male has a straighter beak and the female has a bendy beak. Second thing is that her nest is often just kind of a depression on the dirt or in the rocks. Uh, it's not hidden in the shrubs or trees like many birds' nests. Uh, so it's uh, that leads to a couple different problems for the avocets. One is egg theft. Other things come and eat the eggs. But even more challenging is egg donation. Yeah, other birds come and lay their eggs in her nest. And then she's got to take care of them. <laughs> Pretty crazy. Now, that's really interesting. So what I want to say about this, well, 
I'm going to talk about another bird and you'll learn a whole bunch more. But interesting things. Notice that bendy beak. Okay, here's the last bird that's not a duck. This bird is dressed up very formally in black and white. And of course, very nice high pink, he uh, high heeled shoes in pink. And here is the poem. In black and white feathers, she is dressed to the hilt. With pink heels so high, they qualify not as shoes, but as stilts. Wandering through marshes, picking up treat from the silt. Please click the like button for the black necked stilt. Actually, it's black necked stilt. But if you're saying it with your accent, you can say black necked stilt. But it's not a black naked stilt. Okay, it's dressed up. All right. Ready to take a look? What do you notice? Wow, those legs are huge. And um, and then it's like all white on the underside and black on the top. And oh, there's that white spot on the back of the eye. The beak's not as long. It's kind of sad. Okay, here we go. Interesting facts about the black neck stilt. It has the longest legs of any bird in existence for its body size. Used to be a competition between the flamingos and the black neck stilt, but when the researchers did the research nowadays, it says they have the longest legs of any bird for their body size. With those legs, as you watch them walk, it's more like they're doing um, a roller disco dance because they will bounce their head, they'll rock side to side, they'll skate and then roll. Bounce, you know, rock, skate and roll. Okay, well, you get the idea. Pretty funky. Uh, they have a very loud alarm call, which you will hear as you get close to other birds. And uh, it sounds something like this. And then the other thing they do is because they're dressed up to go out, they'll say, oh, pardon me, I would like to hire a nanny because I'm dressed out to go to dinner. Uh, would you please take care of my young for their entire childhood? That gives you a hint as to who is laying eggs in the avocet's nest, yes, it is the black neck stilt. Now, that's really strange to me that they would do that. I mean, I know that cowbirds do that and cuckoos do that, but they lay them a really different. Why is this one? Well, part of the answer may be that is that avocets and black neck stilts are actually in the same family. Yes, they look like they have different beaks. I mean, the avocet is using its beak to kind of vacuum up. And that's to me why it's curved, because then it can go like this, you know, it can get cover more area when it's vacuuming to get more food. Whereas the still just kind of has to do that uh, stick vacuum thing, you know, where it pokes its uh, beak in and it's got to hopefully grab stuff one at a time. I personally, I'd rather be an avocet with that bigger. But Interestingly, beyond that is the fact that because they're in the same family, but they are different species, can they crossbreed? We know that the definition of a species is that pretty much they cannot crossbreed. That's their individual species. And the answer is yes, they can crossbreed. I've never seen this. If you get ever see what looks like an avocet, but also looks like a stilt, you may see a crossbreed hybrid. What new moniker are you going to give that bird if you see it? Anybody got an idea? Okay, well, what birders are calling it, and again, this is following David Lucas's guide, make up a name that helps you remember the Avo Stilt. Yes, there are Avo Stilts out there. Whew, pretty cool. Tell me if you see one. All right, moving right along. They, these are just some of the many, many birds that you will see on Bear Island. Now, if you wanna know all the birds that people have seen recently on Bear Island, we will put this link in the chat because this link is the list on eBird of who saw what most recently. Pretty cool. It's how I cheat when I get ready to go out to a birding site. I go on eBird and say, oh, what did they see yesterday? Okay, I'll look at some pictures of those, make up some new monikers so I can remember them when I get there. Now, I have to say Bear Island, we just went on a walk of just a very small part of it. We went on the red part, the outline of the path that we went on. But as you can see, the whole island is huge, biggest island and preserve in the San Francisco Bay. And there's just so much to see that we didn't get to see. And a lot of it is water. Now, would you like to see more of Bear Island? 
Me too. And so uh, again, here's this wonderful video that shows more of Bear Island and gives you a clue as to how you can see more of it. Are you ready? All right, here we go. So many of us pass by this place every day. We just zoom past it on the 101. It's such a treat to be able to slow down a little and explore the wetlands of Bear Island. This is an urban wilderness. This is a space that is alive and thriving in the midst of all of this urban use. Bear Island is a restored tidal flat wetland. Managed for agriculture and salt production for more than 100 years, the levees have recently come down to let natural processes reorganize this living tidal system. And what's neat too is seeing Bear Island as it gets restored and more and more of the life coming back, more and more of the natural processes returning and reshaping this land. It's a place where you can come and restore yourself and it's, it's so close. So it's a really a treasure to have it here. When we protect and restore places like Bear Island, we're providing a wonderful home for all of these rare and special species that depend on this place, on the San Francisco Bay estuary ecosystem. Okay, well that's amazing. And uh, you can see uh, that Bear Island is just a great place to go kayaking around and to see, you know, more of it. I mean, the huge quantity of it. Now, the question is, how am I going to do that? Well, fortunately, Matt Dolkus wrote a blog that shares with us how you can go kayak Bear Island, where to rent a kayak, where to launch it from, and even a map of where to paddle. Just really amazing. And uh, Dr. Heller's video that you just saw is at the top. So you'll be able to see that again. All right. I'm looking forward to going out and seeing more of Bear Island through the water. <clears throat> it's just a big, big place. Okay. So in today's workshop, we took some practice sharpening our memory skills, using some of the techniques from David Lucas's work, language making nature, and also from ACOA. You know, he's making up new monikers for everything. Then we discovered some of the more popular and populated migrating ducks and shorebirds. Um, I just wanna say that if you enjoyed that, bird language is a great tool for learning how to protect and connect with your backyard birds and birds at Bear Island. And so, like I said, I've got this class coming up and you can go to either the link that we're gonna put in the chat or go to commonlanguagenature.com to get more information. It's gonna be on four Wednesday evenings and you'll get to share your own personal stories and your own personal questions about birds you're seeing in your backyard or wherever you're going. And again, if you want that complete list of all the birds that you might see out there, including the photos, head on over to commonlanguagenature.com. Okay, I wanna thank everyone for enjoying the birds of Bear Island, and we're gonna take some time to answer some questions. So, welcome back, Mark. Thank you, Jeff. Um, man, ducks, it's a whole life of learning to do there, so thank you. Um, yeah, so we're gonna take a couple of minutes here. We're at one o'clock, but um, if you need to drop off, thanks for joining us. And um, you could certainly watch the next few minutes on our YouTube channel later, um, if you have to get back to work or, or whatever's next on your day. But we're gonna take a few minutes for, for questions here. And um, there was kind of a funny one here. Um, from Richard asking, are all birds waterproof? And good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, no, actually all birds uh, are not as waterproof as ducks. I mean, let's face it, ducks are in the water, the water's cold, you know what it's like when you get in the water, and they need to be able to float. So ducks uh, have used oil from their pineal gland to really oil all their feathers to make sure, excuse me, that water rolls off their back. 
Now, it's true that all birds will use water, and they use water uh, bird baths. That's one of the things I talk about in my class, is how we can protect the birds and uh, support them. And they will use water actually beyond just washing their feathers, but to align the barbs on their feathers, to reconstruct them, to put them back together. But yeah, the ducks and other shorebirds, uh, particularly the ones that float on water, uh, they need to be use that oil a lot more in order to be able to float. And uh, think about diving ducks. They have to compress their feathers and squeeze all the air out, you know, kind of like uh, squeezing out the air from something that floats. Well, that's what the ducks have to do if they're diving ducks. So pretty cool. And uh, yep, ducks definitely have to do an extra amount of cleaning and then oiling. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there's a whole maintenance regime yep. for each bird for their feathers. Um, yeah, and another question from Mariette. Mm -hmm. um, what is the difference between a bill and a beak? Good question. So you may hear people talk about bills and beaks. Beak is the big term that means all of the things that birds have on the front. And bill is the kind of beak that is wider and that ducks have and you know, some other birds have. But you're going to be talking about bills are wider. And you saw the widgeons got that short beak. You know, it's another widget that enables it to tear up grass and be grazing like a goat. And then you saw the shoveler has that long, wide beak. It probably couldn't tear up too much grass on the, the golf course with that. But it enables it to filter out like the bombilla, like that straw for the tea. Good question. Cool, Jeff. And so um, when you're out at Bear Island, you might be there at high tide or low tide. Yep. And uh, Ellen is asking, um, sounds like Ellen's been noticing some feeding behavior at low tide. Mm. So can you um, name some of the things that birds might be eating at low tide? Um, well, um, at low tide, it's mostly hamburgers and tofu. No, actually, oh, yeah. <laughs> I actually don't know. I mean, uh, you know, we talk about invertebrates and you see a uh, little sand fleas and things hopping around, but I don't know. What I do know is that you will see many different kinds of birds with different lengths of their beaks all in the same place. And somehow they're eating different things. Like they're able to jab their beaks in deeper, the longer ones, or they're able to sweep up like the avocet and filter more. So uh, I know they, it's invertebrates and plankton. Uh, I know my dad was an oceanographer and he showed me copepods when I was a little kid. So uh, I think there's all different kinds of stuff that they're munching on. But if you uh, want to eat some vegetables, talk to the widgeon because that's the one mm -hmm. that will help you get the vegetarian meal most easily. There you go. Yeah. Cool. And, and I will say low tide is a good time to go out because you will see the stilts and you'll see the avocets really walking around in the mud. You might not see that mud at high tide. So pretty cool. Oh, there you go. So yeah. would that be your recommendation in terms of birding times of day? Maybe is there a different time of day and coordinating with the tide? Yeah. It gets so, the best experience out there. So the tide varies, right? I mean, in yeah. other words, the low tide is going to be at different times twice a day. And so you can, it's kind of fun to look on the internet and say, okay, when is low tide at Bear Island? And go out there at low tide. Uh, and you'll see more of the birds walking in the mud. On the other hand, at high tide, the ducks will be closer to you because they've got more territory that uh, they can swim and filter feed, especially the shovelers. So I would say go twice and see what you can see. because, And then go a third time and see all these yellow flowers in the spring because uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, Bear Island is just a place that, has so much variance. It's not bare. Uh, it varies a lot. It's got a lot to offer. That's great. And you know, the, the kayaking recommendation for sure, you should check it out. I've done that quite a few times and um, the tides are especially important if, if yeah. you're going to try to kayak out there. Um, okay. You're not experienced with kayaking, especially in the bay. Um, planning with the tides is extremely important. Um, are the, are, can you expect to see ducks year round out there, Ray yeah. asks? Yeah, that's a really good question. You will see more ducks in the winter, but you will definitely see some ducks uh, at different times, yeah. And uh, a nice thing to do is go to eBird and you can click on the bar charts and it'll show you when, what birds come and stay, what time of the year. So if you wanna see shovelers, you can click and see, oh, the shovelers are here right now, but other birds are coming later on. 
So that's kind of a neat uh, little toy or widget that you can play with when you are at eBird. You can uh, check it out and see who's going to be there when. Great, Jeff. Um, one more little specific one here from Medea. Are the Avocet and the Godwit related? Do you happen to know on that? That's a good question. I don't know. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to Birds of the World and look up the Godwit and look up the Avocet and see if I can figure out. You know, the Godwit has got that long pink beak. I'm sorry, it's got that long three-colored beak uh, that... Um, doesn't really look like an abacet uh, or um, or a stilt beak. Uh, the way I remember it is it's pink in the middle and then it's black at the bottom. And so it's kind of like, I, I, here's what I do. I go, it's the devil at the bottom, it's humans in the middle, and it's God at the top. That's the God wit. So I had to make up some kind of mnemonic, mm -hmm. mnemoniker to remember it. And the pink human pink in the middle uh, for some of the humans are pink and some of the humans are, were all different colors. But the point is I had to come up with some way to remember that term Godwit, the marbled Godwit. Yeah. There you go. Um, okay. Well, I actually want to address this more difficult, potentially a little bit controversial one, um, which was from Ellen mm. asking, why is duck hunting allowed? in different areas and so um well i can't give a rundown of where and and what ducks are um allowed for hunting in different areas i think it is important to note um that there are different legitimate um opinions on on the hunting of ducks but it's a very important to note that some of the duck conservation organizations that invest a lot of work in duck habitat restoration and protecting duck populations are um, also affiliated with hunting. So it's a complex issue there in terms of hunting and, and conservation um, and a lot of history to read about there. Um, so, you know, that's all I'll say there. It's a whole subject to learn about. Um, yeah, so I think we'll end there. You know, you covered some really great ones, Jeff. Uh -huh. And um, there's so many birds there. You have the whole bird list on your website, right? That's right. And and how do you remember about how many um, birds were at Bear Island that you had listed? Sure. Well, I listed up to 67 birds because uh, Bear Island has some, but it doesn't have any trees. But, you know, right down the uh, road two miles, there's another uh, section, another hotspot for looking at birds that has some trees in it. And uh, there's even, you know, some of the birds there. So I included pretty much birds of the baylands that you would see because Bear Island is, is a gem, but the bayland stretches out all around the San Francisco Bay. And so wherever you are, if you can get to the baylands, you will be able to see a lot of the birds that we saw today at uh, Bear Island. But Bear Island's a gem. It's, you know, it's really an amazing yeah. place. And so obviously we can go into 67 bird. Yeah. So there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of work that we all have to do to, to do birding out there now. So thanks for that resource. And thanks for the time. You're today, welcome. Hey, Jeff. Um, and Mark, I look forward to sharing more about more shorebirds. So if we have the opportunity in the future, you know, there's just a lot of shorebirds and uh, we, we can go and dive, we can dive in deeper. So thank great. You. So I hope you all go check out commonlanguagenature.com for more information about the birds of Bear Island and Jeff's upcoming classes. Um, I also want to encourage you all to check out our events page, openspacetrust.org slash events. And our exciting news right now is that we have our Wallace Pegner lectures coming up. Um, that will be our next program on January 26th. We'll be hosting uh, Dolores Huerta and Luis Valdez in conversation with Jose Gonzalez of Latino Outdoors. Very excited about that conversation. I'll be there. I'm looking forward to it. I bought my tickets. Yeah, so there you go. And this particular one, the first one is free. And then we have a ticketed series following. Um, so we hope to see you all there. We hope you enjoyed today's program and you have a nice weekend, everybody. Thanks for the time. And thank you again, Jeff. Thank you so much, everybody. Have fun. All right. See ya.